morning, Mr. Franchino. I believe uh, you are representing the appellant this morning. Is that correct? That's correct. And would you like to reserve any time for rebuttal? Five minutes, please. Okay. I will do my best at 15 minutes to find an appropriate place or thereabouts to interject that warning and not uh, perhaps uh, interrupt a train of thought or response to a question. Uh, with that, counsel, you may proceed. Okay. Good morning, and may it please the court. I am Thomas Franchino, and I represent the appellant, the clerk of court, of, uh, and the controller for Collier County, Florida. This is an appeal from a 95% remission on a bail bond. And to set the context, I'd like to give a brief summary of the uh, calendar of the dates. The defendant was arrested in Collier County, first degree felony, September of 2019. A month later, an information was filed in the circuit court of Collier County, charging the defendant with first degree grand theft. And then sometime later in uh, May, May 20th, excuse me, May 1st of 2020, a $30,000 bail bond was posted and he was released. The uh, docket reflects that a notice to appear was served setting a calendar call on December 1st, 2020th and a jury trial on December 7th. The defendant did not appear on December 1st, he absconded. So on December 1st, the bench warrant was issued and the clerk forfeited the bond. One week later, on December 8th, 2020, the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida issued its arrest warrant for the defendant. The arrest warrant uh, reflects that the defendant had been indicted on three federal felonies, grand theft of government property, possession of stolen goods, conspiracy to steal property of the United States. And then on May 27th, 2021, the defendant was arrested by the FBI on that US arrest warrant in Del Rio, Texas. July 7th, the defendant was transported by the United States to the Federal Department of Corrections in Dade County. And on July 21st, the magistrate judge for the United States ordered that the defendant be detained pending a trial and set the trial date for September 27th, 2021. Before that trial date on December 9th, 2021, the surety in this case filed a motion for remission asking for 20, 95% of the bail bond and a remission. We had a hearing on that motion in uh, November of 2021. Mr. Franchino, Mr. Franchino let, me, let me interrupt you here at sure. this point on the, on the remission issue. The, um, I believe one of your arguments is that um, a precondition to the statute um, for for remission entitlement is is that there's a that the defendant has to be returned to the jurisdiction. Where do we find that in the statute in 903.28? 903.28 is the remission statute, correct? And since uh, this is a request for 95%, in other words, the defendant was surrendered or apprehended with 180 days. It's 903.28 subdivision three. And that provides that the defendant surrenders or is apprehended within 180 days of the forfeiture, the court on motion at a hearing may uh, direct a remission of up to, but not more than 95%. And then the statute gives several levels of involvement by the surety. Uh, one is if the surety is apprehended or surrendered, excuse me, if the surety apprehended or surrendered the defendant, or if the apprehension or surrender the defendant was substantially procured or caused by the surety, and then, or the surety has substantially attempted, uh, 
to uh, apprehend or that surrender the defendant. Then it states a condition precedent and the delay has not thwarted the proper prosecution of the defendant. But the, the provision, the, but uh, the provision Mr. Francina, but the provision uh -huh. you're reading, subsection three, doesn't specifically say returning the defendant to the jurisdiction, um, well, but, yeah. but, but talks about either substantial attempts or that there wasn't delay in the proper prosecution um, of the defendant. Is that right? It's, yes, it states the delay has not thwarted the proper prosecution. The defendant can't be prosecuted unless and until he's returned to Collier County. And then in this case, since the surety made no uh, effort to procure uh, the defendant, we're operating under the last sentence of uh, the statute. Uh, in addition, remission shall be granted when the surety did not substantially participate or attempt to participate in the apprehension or surrender of defendant. That's this matter. Uh, and the surety agrees on that. When the costs of returning the defendant to the jurisdiction of the court have been deducted from the remission. So obviously there will not be no cost of returning the defendant to the jurisdiction to be deducted unless the defendants returned to the uh, jurisdiction. And when the delay has not thwarted the proper prosecution of the defendant. Again, uh, you can't properly prosecute the defendant unless he has been returned to the jurisdiction. So I say yes, that requirement is expressly placed in the statutory language and is a requirement. Also, if you look at the cases discussing the statute, they make clear that the purpose of the statute is to incentivize or to reward a surety for returning a defendant to the court once they've absconded. Uh, and uh, I have those cases cited in my brief. Uh, I, just, I just have one, one, sure. um, one more question for you on the on subsection three. Um, it is the, um, the, the position here of the surety that the clerk did not raise the issue of delay below. Can you address that for me? The, we never did get to that point. The judge terminated the uh, hearing before that. But as I uh, argued in my reply brief, the court, the statute and the court cases on the statute make clear that it is the burden of the surety to establish all conditions precedent. Uh, matter of fact, that's the case I was about to get to, accredited surety versus Putnam County. It was a 50 CA case in 1988. I cited in my reply brief. Uh, it says, as we read the statute, the movement, and that's parentheses, the surety, has the burden after foreclosure to show that it substantially procured or substantially attempted to procure the return of the defendant for trial and that any delay has not thwarted proper prosecution. The court continues, once the movement has established these two conditions precedent then, and parentheses, and only then, does the trial court have discretion to remit, remit some or all of the forfeited bond to surety. So uh, the way the statute is structured, 903.28, actually eight creates the burden to provide an affidavit and for the surety to make the showing of what's necessary to obtain a, a remission and the courts uh, follow that in requiring the surety to prove that there has not been, that trial has not been thwarted. Additionally, in this case, the fact that the defendant was in detention by the United States for uh, the federal crimes he uh, committed 
raises a presumption uh, under the uh, case of Pinellas County versus Robertson, that's a second district court of appeals case from 1986, that prosecution was thwarted. It, that case stands for the proposition that the detention of the defendant creates a legal presumption that prosecution was thwarted. So Mr. French, that, you know, I, I want to ask a question that I don't think you addressed in the uh, briefing or in oral argument. The first part of 903.28 says that the court shall order remission of the forfeiture if it determines that there was no breach of the bond. Yes. Reading that in connection with the rest of the statute, isn't there a breach of the bond if the defendant has not appeared either for trial at the time it was scheduled or after arrest or surrender, he is not appearing. So doesn't the bond remain in breach? In the broadest sense, yes. Uh, to, in order to make the statute make sense, I believe that when they say there was no breach of the bond, they don't mean uh, the breach by the defendant or the surety and not appearing at the trial or the hearing date as ordered. They mean the breach of the bond that the surety paid the, uh, the uh, foreclosed uh, remission amount, the forfeited remission amount within 60 days of the forfeiture. But isn't one of the obligations under the bond for the surety to produce the defendant in order to be prosecuted. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, you know, we have, we had another case recently where this issue about breach of the bond and the uh, failure to timely pay or remit the forfeiture amount, you know, in our view, constituted a breach of the bond. I know you may uh, have felt that ties in with what you just said, or you feel that ties in with what you just said. But part of the bond uh, conditions are that the surety essentially take control of the defendant and assure his appearance for trial. Now, the trial court didn't make any findings on whether the bond was breached or not breached. So how does that all tie together with your argument that the surrender or the arrest of the defendant in another jurisdiction has necessarily, when you read the statute together, has to uh, thwart the clerk's, I'm sorry, the uh, surety's request for remission. Yes, I'd have to step back in order to tie that together, but it does tie together because the, uh, again, I argue to the trial court, the statute's clear, you have to return the defendant to the jurisdiction for proper prosecution. The defense to that raised by the surety at, at, at the hearing was, but for the act of the state of Florida in not uh, transporting and refusing to extradite the defendant, we would have had him back. So there's a series of cases on uh, the entitlement to a remission where the surety was prevented from returning the defendant. And the sureties always rely on the Orange County case. It's cited, uh, it's surety construct, uh, excuse me, surety uh, insurance versus Orange County. It's a 50 CA case from 2001. And it's uh, cited again in the uh, answer brief the operative language in Orange County is that where a defendant would have been returned for prosecution, but for, that's the language, but for the stat, state's unwillingness to extradite, the surety is not prevented from seeking a remission under 903.28. So accordingly, the sole and the direct cause for the failure to produce the defendant has to be uh, an action by the state of Florida. This is. This well, let me let me ask one question about that yeah. case. There was yeah. evidence presented in that case that Jamaica was prepared to uh, extradite the or allow the extradition of the defendant if the state elected to do so. The state elected not to do so, so he wasn't extradited. But the the right. essential proof was that 
he can be brought back to the jurisdiction. Do we have any of that proof in this case that the feds, the federal authorities would have released the defendant for prosecution? No, no we don't. Uh, you're, you're correct. And the uh, defendants in Orange County were found in Jamaica and arrested, but they weren't arrested for committing a crime in Jamaica and the Jamaican officials were willing to release them to the surety to bring back to the United States. And the surety said, I'm ready to go. I'll transport them back. I'll pay all the costs. And Jamaica said, well, you need a piece of paper from the state of Florida, granting you the right to extradite and the state of Florida would In this case, Council Bans, as you, you say, conclude your remarks, I'll let you know you are at 15. Okay, thank you. In this case, of, of course, the defendant went out, committed three felonies, was arrested by the United States, held in detention, pending trial by the United States. There was no basis to believe that the United States would release him to Florida. There was no obligation uh, for the United States to return the defendant to Florida. And that was stated in L. Estes Bonding versus Pinellas County, a decision by this court in 2003. So this, this case is controlled by those authorities holding that the prevention or impossibility doctrine is inapplicable to a bond remission when the return is prevented by a third party. And I cite uh, some of those cases. One is public service mutual insurance versus Florida. And that's back in 1961. And in that case, the defendant was bonded out. He took off, fled Florida. He was arrested and charged and convicted in South Carolina of a federal crime, similar to the facts here. And the surety sought a remission saying, it's impossible for me to bring him back. He's not being held in a federal prison. And uh, the court held that imprisonment and detention of defendant under those circumstances does not relieve the surety from its obligations. Uh, and when a foreign jurisdiction arrests a defendant on different crimes, the great weight of authority holds that surety is not excused from the bond obligations. And then there are two decisions from this court, the Second District Court of Appeals, that follow that precedent. The first is State of Florida versus Sunshine Bail Bonds. That was, that was a case decided by you in 2007. And in that, the trial court granted a remission and the defendant had absconded, fled Florida, and while uh, out, was shot and killed by law enforcement in Georgia. Again, the surety said, well, it's impossible for me to uh, bring him back. He's dead. He's been, he's been shot. And the trial court granted a remission. And this court reversed that and stated that the impossibility of performance does not excuse the surety's obligation to prevent defendant from leaving the jurisdiction, even though a third party prevented the surety from bringing the defendant back. It's a long-winded way to get to answer your question, just, Justice Silburn. Uh, so you're at 18. This, this court looks at the failures of the surety to fulfill its bond obligations and keeping control of the defendant and stopping him from fleeing, stopping him from committing crimes while he's out on bond, which is what happened here. And then finally, and then I'll take my break, the second District Court of Appeals again in Pinellas County versus Robertson, that was a 1986 case cited in my brief. The defendant failed to appear. He fled Florida, ended up in Arizona, he was arrested and held on other charges by Arizona. And the Florida state attorney decided not to extradite. And uh, again, the trial court granted remission. This, this court on appeal reversed the remission and held that uh, declining to extradite does not relieve the surety from the forfeiture. The state is not the surety's surety, quoting a, an Oregon case. So as the surety failed to perform its obligation to keep the defendant under control in Florida, uh, the defendant was held liable on its bond obligation by this court and the remission. Uh, and that is the situation here. Uh, when I first saw that case, 
I said, well, I don't know if the Second District Court of Appeals even would utilize the prevention defense in any circumstance. But now when I think about it, I think that it refused to provide it in the Pinellas County versus Robinson case because the defendant was arrested and charged by Arizona for Arizona crimes. It wasn't the refusal of the state attorney to extradite that prevented the return. So I will, I will stop there and reserve my time. Thank you. Counsel, you stopped at 19 minutes and 58 seconds. You have two seconds remaining. <laughs> Uh, at this point, we will hear from counsel for the appellee. Thank you and good morning. May it please the court. My name is Philip Reisenstein, counsel for the appellee in this case, the surety in this case. And I will address some of the questions that were raised by the judges in this matter. Well, counsel, and let me I start with, with a, a couple of questions that may help me probe through this case. One, sure. would you agree that the uh, bond is a three-party contract between the insurety, the defendant, and the court? Yes, so the case law okay. specifically And the promise that. in the contract is to uh, produce the defendant at all appropriate hearings. Is that yes. correct? Yes. So when the defendant was not uh, uh, presented for either docket sounding or the trial, that would constitute either or both a breach of the bond? Well, I Don't you understand. have a duty to present? Your client yes. has a duty to present. So the yes. failure to present is a breach of the condition of the bond, is it not? Well, in one aspect it is, but we know from 903.28 that there's more to it than that. Well, we start there, and that would have thwarted the prosecution because the case could not go forward. Is that correct? Well, I disagree with that. And the reason really? why I he's not there and you didn't produce him, and they're ready to start trial. And he's not there, and, and usually we don't waive the defendant's presence at court. How does that not thwart that immediate prosecution? Well, I would disagree, I guess, with the term thwart, meaning on that particular day, it may well, very well have Wasn't the that process. the promise to produce him on that particular day? Well, of course it was, but as I okay. said... Okay, so now we have a breach. And if we take a look at the other Collier County case that was mentioned that Judge Watley authored for this court back in uh, 2007, also involving the clerk of the court all of, out of Callier County, it suggests that uh, the state's not the shorty shorty, and it was your obligation. And I'm, you know, I look at the bottom of that opinion says, similarly in Robertson, the defendant failed to appear as scheduled and was later arrested. The state declined, decided not to extradite. This court noted the state is not the shorty shorty and the shorty remains answerable on the bond. So there's been no producing. The shorty hasn't produced the defendant in the court. It seems like this case would suggest that a reversal is also in order. How do I distinguish that case and its recitation of the law and the facts since they seem very similar? Yes, I will explain how. Thank because you. If, 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 thank you judge. Yeah, if, I'm serious because I've got this case. Yes, sir. No, I understand. Okay, so thank you. If, if the inquiry um, ended there, then we would not have the statutory framework that was created by 903.28. And I hope the court agrees because it appears clear to me that 903.28 clearly envisions situations such as the ones that we have here. And the case law that we've cited in our brief also envisions situations like the one that we have here. If the only concern was that a surety was not entitled to remission upon him or her, upon the defendant being arrested and not appearing at trial, the, the, the analysis would end and there would never be a remission statute. But the case law and the legislature has created a framework with the understanding, I believe, that of course some defendants flee and therefore the surety is incentivized to go and locate that individual. And that's why the statute provides for remission. So once we know that the inquiry does not end respectfully with the questions that you asked me, although I certainly agree it's, it's an important part of the analysis, the statute requires more. 
And what I'd first like to do is draw the court's attention to the affidavit that was filed by the surety agent in this case, part of the surety's motion that was heard before the lower court. And I will note that there was no written response by um, the appellant in this case. And the affidavit that was evidenced before the court alerts the court that the defendant was arrested by the U.S. Marshals on 52821 in Del Rio, Texas. On June 1st, 2021, the surety agent contacted Collier County Sheriff's Department to advise of the same and was told by Deputy Melissa that they would not be extraditing the defendant as the warrant is Florida extradite only. The defendant was transported to Miami-Dade County Federal Department of Corrections on 7721, where he remains incarcerated at this time. There are costs of transportation, the amount of $201.31 that have been paid by the surety. The proper prosecution has not been thwarted as the defendant remains in custody at this time. Those facts were not disputed by the appellant, other than the fact that he just wasn't specifically sitting in Collier County Jail. That appears to be their only argument in this case. And when we get to that point, all of the case law that we have provided and many of the cases say that the fact that the state declines to extradite an individual will not thwart an otherwise proper motion for remission. Let, let, me, ask the, a que- let me ask a question on that. Yes, because sir. the fifth district case has a fact that seems to be distinct from our case. In the fifth district, it seemed evident that Jamaica would allow extradition if requested. The problem here is, did your client's affidavit give any indication that the federal authorities would release or transport or allow the transportation of the defendant in order to appear in Collier County for prosecution? No, I believe the affidavit speaks for itself. It's exactly so in what, the absence of that, in the absence of that, that seems to me to make the fifth district case distinguishable. So assuming I'm right about that, Pinellas County versus Robertson seems to support the clerk's position. If we agree with you that the statutory interpretation requires remission, do we then have to recede from Pinellas County versus Robertson? Uh, to the to the extent that the court finds that there's a conflict, I, I do believe you do. And I would point to you a case cited in our brief, Allegheny Casualty Company. It's a fourth district case in 2003. And one of the things that they say in that case is that the decisions in county bonding and surety continental are distinguishable because in those cases, the sureties were ready, willing, and able to produce the defendants. They were prevented from complete performance of the bail contract by an act of the state refusal to extradite. The case that your honor cited, the case that the appellant is arguing is not the only case. In fact, it's kind of funny that a couple of these involved Jamaica, but it's not the only case in which the state refused to do it. But but it's a case, but it's a case from our court. Yes, sir. I do understand. We're bound by the case from our court. I do understand that. And so, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. In the cases, at least the ones that I read, where remission was granted, there was some evidence that the defendant could be produced in the uh, in the county where trial was scheduled to be had. Whereas in this case, we don't know that the federal authorities would have agreed to release him for purposes of being prosecuted in, in Collier. I would say that in the cases that we've cited in which um, remission was granted either by the trial court and affirmed or reversed by the appellate court and remission was granted, many of them simply say that the um, reason the defendant was not brought was because the state declined to extradite. And the, and the facts, for instance, in the county bonding case, don't specifically state that the person was otherwise ready, willing, and able, that there was permission from the feds, for instance, or county bonding that the person was in the Dade County Jail. I would but, argue to the court that, I apologize. Yeah, Mr. Russell, thing, but in, in looking at Allegheny, I think the, um, the surety in that case was not ready, willing, and able. And the reason was because of the treaties that prevented um, that extradition um, by the state. But, but can't, isn't that similar to the facts here where we have the U.S. Marshal 
arresting and, and the defendant being held on federal charges that are preventing the extradition of this defendant? Isn't that the same here? Well, I, I don't think we have that in the record. I think that this is a massive assumption on part of the appellant. What we know from the record is that the surety contacted um, Collier County and said he's in custody in Texas. And they said, we're not going to extradite him. It's only for in-state Florida. When the argument was held before the lower court and all the um, appellant kept arguing is he's not here in Collier County. They never presented evidence before the lower court that the feds re refused. But isn't this the surety's burden of proof? Well, the surety has a certain amount of burden of proof, and we've met that through the motion and through the affidavit. If a defense was so raised... Let me pause you there. Yes. The affidavit says that the proper prosecution has not been thwarted. That's right. a conclusion of law, arguably. What is the facts? And part of my concern is the nature of the hearing. You know, if we had an evidentiary hearing, then everybody would have had an opportunity to put forth their facts. The sovereign in this case, the federal government is superior to the state. The sheriff's department says basically that uh, the warrant that we have is only a Florida warrant, so we can't extradite. The agency charged with prosecution under the executive branch of our state is a state attorney's office. We don't hear a thing from them about the failure to appear for the original trial has somehow impacted its ability to call witnesses and such as that. So the only thing that we know about thwarting is that the case did not go as scheduled and that didn't happen. And my concern is a lot of this, and I'm not laying fault to anyone. I'm just saying, as I read the transcript, there were answers to questions that I thought are necessary if the surety is going to carry its burden of persuasion. It seems to me that merely saying that the deputy sheriff says, at this time, the only thing we have is a Florida only. The state attorney's office is charged with prosecution. They could put a hold. They could order a hold. They could do the same thing to have them detain him when the federal cases are over, arguably. But we don't know from this record. So on this record, I'm having a difficult time to find where the surety put forth facts from which a trial court could conclude that the prosecution was not ultimately thwarted. I mean, yes, sir. that's my concern. And it may, maybe it's too much or I'm, I'm being too um, granular, if you will, if that's the right word. Um, but that's where I'm concerned about too on a, on a procedural aspect. Well, let me address that. We do know that the trial court paused during the hearing to review case law, had read the affidavit, had heard argument of counsel and had made a specific finding Specifically, and I believe I'm quoting accurately from the record, I find that the surety has done all that it could do. I think what I'm hearing from the court is that um, there, there should have been more put forth by the surety, but at some point when a, when a surety comes forward, makes a motion, tells the court and the, and the authorities where somebody is, how they can get them, that they've otherwise done all that they can do, and the the, the clerk, the appellant, doesn't file something in writing, just says he's not sitting in Collier County Jail. They sort of framed the issue here before the lower court. We didn't. They said he's not in the jail. We said that's not what the statute requires. Yes, sir. The statute, I, I think, arguably, so that you can respond to my point, because once you leave and we close this thing down, I don't get to talk to anybody anymore. Yes, sir. You would show you've done all you could to get him there, but the statute says you have to show that you ha that prosecution hasn't been thwarted, whatever that's going to be. And I didn't go look up the definition in blacks and where else were thwarted, but it means probably close to the word impeded. And we know that the first one didn't happen. So if you're going to produce him in court, if you got his body, you'd say, here, he's not thwarted. We're placing you back in his custody. And you're saying the U.S. government won't give it to us and the state won't go try to pull him out from the U.S. government. And states an inferior sovereign, how do they do that? So, so my concern is you have a burden of proof under the statute to show that the prosecution for in the future, unlike the past, hasn't been thwarted. Yes, sir. But my, my response to you is when we come forward and make that allegation and the other side does not challenge it before the lower court, raises it on appeal for the first time, okay. and now we're being held to say, well, gee, you should have sort of guess that they were going to pick this up on appeal and done more. They framed the issue before the lower court. We did not. 
They simply oh, said, hang on, I'm not sure I, I, I can't agree with that. I mean, the issue that was framed was your client filing a motion for remission and filing an affidavit in support. Isn't the burden on your client to establish the necessary elements to get the remission? And the clerk can sit there silently if you don't prove those elements. Isn't that correct? Well, when we, I, I mean, in, in theory, yes, but in reading- well, Not the in record, theory, no, no. <laughs> this isn't a theoretical exercise. This is a practical exercise. And, you have to show that the defendant could in fact be produced for purposes of prosecution. The cases that hold in your client's favor that you're using in your client's favor all have something reflecting an impossibility to produce the defendant. The defendant is in jail in another jurisdiction, won't be released. The defendants in another jurisdiction will be released, but the state says, no, we're not gonna do it. There's one case where the defendant is dead. Uh, you, know, you can't produce the dead body. But this case, you know, I'm just very concerned about the absence of any effort on your client's part to establish that the federal authorities would have allowed the defendant to be transported for prosecution. And that seems to me to be the one factor that hurts your position. And I don't think the state has to do, or the clerk has to do anything to prove to the contrary until you meet your burden to prove that he could be produced. Well, it, and the reason why I said in theory is because every case obviously is factually a little bit different. But my concern as an appellate advocate, and quite frankly, as someone who appears as a trial lawyer, is when we file motions that are contested and we go to court and we make allegations, and this could be across the board of, of a criminal case or a civil case, and the response focuses on one particular part. In this case only, he's not sitting in Collier County. I think that's why we were issues to be preserved for appeal, I think it's sort of difficult for the advocate to address that specific act, allegation here, which they did in the lower court, and then also having an affidavit saying, essentially meeting the requirements, sort of saying, well, let me just go through everything else in here. So, that, so, that, so ultimately, the question for us will be, did your affidavit meet all the requirements? I would think that that's part of the question. Did the tr and the trial court made the dis the finding that the surety had done all it could do, and Mr. not Ryan just in I, yes. I, I mean, I have to I have to take issue with the trial court's finding that the surety did all that they could do. Uh, I, I think some of the cases when you when you when you look at at the reasoning for the courts um, in denying the remission is that um, kind of similar to this case is you have. The defendant who fails to appear and in the interim, um, and, and in this case, in the interim before the surety makes even the phone call, um, that defendant is arrested um, seven days later on federal charges. And so to counter what you're arguing is that the surety did not do all that it could have done. And as a result, federal charges were brought and he was arrested and um, detained on those federal charges. So there's these acts in, in, in between that, that occurred. So I, I don't know that I necessarily agree with what the trial court's findings were on that. And a conclusory statement by, um, by the surety and the affidavit that the delay, I mean, that's something that should have been brought out by, by the facts. And I, I just don't think they're there to substantiate that finding. Sure. Well, uh, um, if we look at what the federal charges are, they were based on what appears to be um, a longstanding federal investigation. This is not something where someone was arrested for robbing a bank or anything like that. I believe it was some sort of, of, of fraud. Those things don't happen overnight. So the fact that this person was indicted and an indictment was unsealed, I think, would lead us to safely conclude wasn't something he had done since the time period that he fled, although, and, and the docket for the federal court is in the record here. Um, I, I see that I have about a minute and a half left. Um, I have a, to this point sort of refrained from what you probably hear all the time, but we do know that- um, Counsel, um, if it's helpful to you, uh, in light of the yeah. fact that Mr. Franchino only has two seconds, I'm gonna probably right. give you an extra minute so that he can have a minute and two seconds. So you can take that in consideration of framing your remarks. 
Well, first of all, as much time as the court wishes to to give to Mr. Franchino to respond, I have no no say and would encourage the court to do Very so. kind and professional of you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sure. Um, I was hoping to finish earlier and give him the rest of my time. <laughs> um, so in, in summary, and, I, and I've, I've refrained until now to say that we do know that the general theory is that remissions are not favored in the law. But I would ask the court to take one step further and just take a look at what we know from other cases, talk about why the remission statute is set up the way it is set up. It's to incentivize the surety to do these kinds of things rather than the state track somebody down, them to track somebody down, which they did here. I do understand the court's concerns here. I would say that because my client and pointed this out to the trial court is not a agency, there's only so much that we can do. So the surety couldn't enter into negotiations with the federal government. The surety couldn't enter into negotiations with the marshal. All the surety could do was tell the entities in charge, this is what you need to do. And with regard to the thwarting of the prosecution, my client does not have access to the state attorney's office file or for that matter, what their theory of the case is and whether or not they have witnesses. So they can bring forward to the court that in their opinion, what they're seeing, the prosecution hasn't been thwarted. It's not many year delay. And then at some point it's incumbent upon these issues to be raised before the trial court so that the trial court judge knows and we can address this on appeal. That was not done. These issues are not preserved. I thank the court for its time. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Franchino, you have a, a minute so that you can uh, make a response. Thank you very much. Uh, I would point out that the operative langu language in the Orange County case is but for, but for the state's refusal to extradite, the defendant wasn't returned. That does not exist here. Of course, he was detained arrested, detained, held for trial by the feds, excuse me, the federal government. Secondly, uh, the surety's hanging its defense on the fact that uh, it was a Florida only uh, transport order, uh, supposedly as stated by the sheriff, the defendant was actually returned to Florida by the federal government. And this is in the affidavit of the surety and, and was held in the federal detention facility in Dade County. So it was the Florida only, excuse me, the Florida only warrant did not prevent in any way the production of a defendant in this case. And that's all I would say. Uh, okay. the, the, the trial court uh, erred as a matter of law in this reading. Uh, the Judge Kessler, if I can ask one question before we wrap up, you just said that the Florida warrant did not prevent production of the defendant. So what prevented the production of the defendant? The fact that he was in federal uh, lockup, uh, being held for trial uh, to go to court on, I think it was September 27th uh, for three well, that doesn't, doesn't that tie in then to the appellee's argument that it, it's impossible for the defendant to be transported to face charges in Collier? Yeah. It, it is impossible, but that's not an impossibility that excuses the surety according to the cases I cited, and uh, the state of Florida has nothing to do with that impossibility. So do you, do, you do you disagree then with what I suggested earlier, that the affidavit of the surety was insufficient because it did not reflect whether or not the uh, federal authorities would release the defendant? No, I agree. The affidavit of uh, the surety or the uh, bonds person was merely conclusory and and not sufficient in this case. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. I very much appreciate your hanging in there and really giving us a good response to our questions and inquiries. It's very much appreciated when we have counsel as well prepared as both of you to help us uh, get to the legal issues. I thank you all. Thank I hope you. you all stay well and look forward next time we can see each other in person instead of by video. I would love